Hello and welcome to Lansdowne's morning pre-recorded message for the 16th of April 2023. Our passage today is from Matthew chapter 16 and I'm going to read verses 13 to 20. Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20. Let's hear the word of God. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say? that I am. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask now that you would speak to us through the opening up of this passage of scripture We thank you for the clear declaration here that Jesus said, I will build my church. And Father, I pray for all those who watch or listen to this message. Lord, for for those members of Lansdowne, to remember that Lansdowne is yours. It's not mine or theirs or any of ours. It's your church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those listening who are not at Lansdowne, I pray your blessing upon their churches also. And as each one of us hears your word, give us encouragement to see your glorious plan for the building of the church. Build our faith, Lord. Build our prayerfulness for these things to happen, for the church to be built kingdom to be extended from shore to shore all around the world let us hear your voice father we need you these things we ask in jesus name amen amen so whose church is it is it the church of the particular denomination the church of the name of the pastor or elders that are on the notice board or or in the church magazine or the church membership directory? Is it the name of the location? Does that define who owns the church? Does the community own the church? Well, yes, the community is led by elders and and pastors. It serves the community. It serves the people. But ultimately... The church is Jesus Christ's. It says in verse 18, I will build my church. Now this Sunday and next Sunday, I'm recording a couple of, as it were, one-off messages, not part of a series, because from the 25th, sorry, the 24th of April, I will be on a four-month sabbatical, actually four months and one week sabbatical. The reason for that is 20th of, sorry, 29th of March 2000, I was called as the pastor of this church, Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church. And having served for 20 years and before that full time for three years as assistant pastor, the leadership here of very graciously granted me a four-month 
sabbatical plus a week to kind of get myself uh, sorted before I uh, go on sabbatical uh, fully from the beginning of May. And I believe it's very important for Lansdowne and indeed for anyone else listening who are in different churches, different situations, to realise the church belongs to Jesus Christ. Lansdowne will not fall apart while I'm on sabbatical because it's not my church. It's a church saved, purchased by the blood of Christ, belonging to him, and he is building it. That is the heart of everything. Now, just to say as a brief point, uh, while on my personal channel, if you've come to watch this sermon because you're following Peter Day, there won't be any more sermons on the Peter Day channel for a while. I may post short reflections from time to time. So after next Sunday, the 23rd, I'm not going to be posting any more sermons on my own personal channel. But if you're watching on the Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church channel, then the sermons will continue to be uploaded. Uh, not every week, because sometimes we'll have visiting speakers, but they'll be uploaded on a regular basis during that time, probably once a fortnight, sometimes twice, and then a gap of a week or so. But there'll be regular messages on the Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church channel. So I encourage you to keep watching those and be built up in those. But the reason for today's message and the reason for next Sunday's message for me on whichever channel you're listening to is to remind us whose church it is. Now, I think when you come to a passage like this, um, I'm sure you've read it before. I'm sure you've wondered things like who's the rock, what are the keys and so on. And yes, there are challenges in understanding and interpreting this passage. And I'm going to get into some of that because it's important that we understand what these things mean so that we can rest our trust in Christ, whose church it is. If we understand what these other things are, it will help us to realise, have a greater assurance that the church indeed is Christ's church and that he is building it. So the first thing I want to address, therefore, is who or what is the rock? Now, there's a context to this, uh, to verse 18, and the context begins in, in verse 13, although it actually continues uh, previously in, in, the, in the previous part of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Jesus addresses there the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and that they're their false teaching. And now he zooms in to his disciples and says to them, OK, this is what's going on. This is what they're saying. This is what they're teaching. I've warned you about their teaching. Now, who are they saying I am? And then when they, they, he gives, they get an answer of the different answers, the, only actually the positive answers that people are giving in verse 14. Then he asks them, verse 15, who do you say I am? Am. But the context is not just where this is. So Jesus is revealing himself in contrast to the false teaching that is coming from the Pharisees and Sadducees. And not all their teaching was false. They were, in many ways, the Pharisees were the evangelicals of today, the fundamentalists of today. They were sound in their theology, but their application was wrong and excluding people locking out of the kingdom, hence here the reference to the keys in verse 19. They were locking people out of the kingdom by putting all these barriers to actually being in the kingdom and being a true uh, follower of the God of Israel. They were excluding people who they regarded as sinners. So in contrast, now Jesus is revealing who he is to his disciples. They knew or should have known but even here, we're told, verse 17, that that revelation that Peter has comes from the Heavenly Father. But I miss a key point, and that is found in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi was a, uh, an area of pagan worship, and it had been an area of pagan worship for many, many centuries before that. 
And so there was a temple there to Zeus. There was a, a, there was, it was a center for the worship of Pan. It had former been a, formerly been a Canaanite place of worship and for some was regarded as a dwelling place of the dead, even the gateway to the underworld. So as much paganism based there. And of course, all of the gods of Greece and of Rome, they were worshipped by the pagans around there, worshipped by the Romans, they worshipped by the Greeks, they worshipped by others, but they provided no solid foundation for life. I've been reading... Uh, uh, for part of kind of expanding my literature, understanding of literature, some of the, the, the Greek myths. And these gods are, are no basis for trust, no basis for love. They are, they are fickle. They are selfish. Um, they, they use and abuse uh, people in the most terrible ways. They start and end wars for their own gratification, for fun, not for uh, any, whereas a living God works through the sin and rebellion of man for the good purpose of saving multitudes and bringing them into his eternal kingdom through his son. These, these gods were no basis, no solid rock upon which could people could build their lives. But now Jesus is revealing who he really is. And today is the same. There is no solid rock upon which people can build their lives. Whatever ideology of secularism or religious ideology or the different uh, moral boundaries that been, and ethical boundaries that are being pushed and changed uh, that have been uh, stood for centuries, for uh, a millennia, dare I say, grounded in scripture, such as sexual purity and so on. All these things are swept away and now we're not left with anywhere to stand and we need to see who Jesus is so we stand secure on him. The church needs to realise it's Christ's church and therefore we're not permitted to change what he says. We follow him. Now that's all by way of background to the context. Verse 15. He said to them, Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say I am? The you there is plural. He's asking them all. But Peter responds he says on their behalf he responds you are the christ verse 16 the son of the living god he is the christ he is the promised messiah the promised anointed one the one who would come and deliver his people god's anointed chosen king the one promised to david who would forever be upon the throne. He is also the son of the living God, the living God, not a God, not a dead God like the gods worshipped in Caesarea Philippi, but the living eternal God who always has been and is and evermore shall be the eternal God. He is a son he is the, the, not the, a son, not a created being, but he is himself, God the Son, the true and living one. Simon Peter recognises who he is. And it's to that declaration that Jesus makes this response. Firstly, verse 17, blessed. So this is, this is what God has done. He, you are favoured. By God, he's named Simon, his birth name, bar Joan. that means son of Joan or son of John, as, as John's gospel puts it, reminding him that this is God's gracious revelation. He hasn't reached this because he's intelligent. He's reached this conclusion because God the Father has revealed it to him. Then verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter. So now he's beginning to explain why and again, John's gospel records this, why he gave Simon also the name Peter, because that name means a stone or a rock. And then he says, verse 18, on this rock, I will build my church 
And the question is, and there are actually more than three interpretations of this, but I'm going to give you the kind of three main ones. When Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church, is he saying on Peter? Is he saying on himself? Because he's the Christ, the son of the living God. Or is he saying on the basis of Peter's confession, I will build my church? And the answer to that is yes. Let me explain. Peter does become the leader of the disciples. He's the one who runs to the tomb when the women say it's empty. He's the one that Jesus takes aside and restores personally after Peter denied him. The others all fled, but Peter is given a special treatment. He's singled out when the women go to the tomb. Go and tell my disciples and Peter. He, Peter is the one who stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches. Peter is the one who goes first to the Gentiles. So Jesus does appoint him with an important foundational role in the early church. So yes, in a sense it is Peter. But what Jesus isn't saying is that Peter would pass on this role to one particular bishop the Bishop of Rome, who's now called the Pope. No one has supreme authority over the church, only Jesus. So Peter's not the rock in that permanent sense that, and Peter and his successors in that permanent sense that many, uh, the, the official Roman Catholic doctrine teaches. Peter does have a foundational role. So is he talking about Peter? Yes. But he can't be simply talking about Peter because Jesus doesn't say, you are Peter and on you I will build my church. He says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. He's making a distinction then between Peter and this rock. Peter the man is not perfect. The name Peter means a little rock or stone, a loose stone. Whereas this rock, the word for rock there, is solid rock. Peter did prove to be loose and unstable and he failed. A few verses later in verse 22 of Matthew 16, he denies, no, no, he doesn't deny, he rebukes Jesus saying he shan't go to the cross. It'll never happen to you. And then a little later, he denies him three times. Peter, the, 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 as it were, the head apostle uh, for until actually James was appointed as the head of the Jerusalem church in Acts. We see that in Acts 15 as James takes the lead. But Peter needed a heavenly vision to go to the Gentiles. Peter needs to be rebuked by Paul for fa falling back to the law and not eating with the Gentiles. You find that in Galatians chapter two. So Peter is the rock in one sense, but he's not, that's not all that Jesus is talking about because Peter is a loose rock, a small rock, and not a solid foundation. Now in various other scriptures, we see Jesus referred to as the foundation. So for example, in 1 Corinthians three, verse 11, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then we see Jesus and the apostles combined in Ephesians 2.20, where it says the household of God is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets as their teaching. And then Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And of course, we also see in relation to the church in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we are, that Jesus, verse 4, 1 Peter 2, 4, is a living stone. We are living stones being built up in the spiritual house. But then in verses 6 and 7 of 1 Peter 2, in fact, 6, 7 and 8, Jesus is referred to as the chosen cornerstone who lines everything up. So he, Jesus is foundational. And yet in this illustration... Jesus is the builder. So while Jesus is the foundation, that's not all 
that Jesus is saying when he says on this rock. So Peter, to, an, to a point, Jesus, yes, because he's foundational. But what about this confession? That's why I say, yes, it's actually all of these things are something of what Jesus is saying. Through the declaration of who Jesus is, if, if we build a religious institution based upon a wrong understanding of Jesus, Jesus simply a good teacher or Jesus simply a healer, if that is our foundation, then we're not building church. And he, 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 he doesn't build church on a wrong understanding of who he is. He builds a, a, a church on the true understanding of who he is. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. And as he reveals himself in the next section, in verse 21, he's also the crucified Messiah who will die for the sins of his people and be raised from the dead. So the church is built. The rock is this true understanding of who Jesus is. The rock is this declaration. And also, yes, to an extent, Peter. And yes, we know from other scriptures that Jesus is foundational. So it's all of these things. But we cannot build church. Or rather, he will not build church through us apart from the true faith in him and, and the true Christ, who he really is. And on this foundation, Jesus builds his church. And in Acts, as they proclaimed that Jesus is the son of the living God, that Jesus is a crucified risen Messiah, so Jesus fulfilled what he says here, whether it was Peter preaching or Paul preaching or anybody else preaching, upon this declaration of who Jesus is, the Spirit worked and people were saved and added to the church and then they received the apostles' teaching and they grew upon this foundation of Jesus Christ and who he is. And the same is true today. People believe through God's saving grace that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we proclaim this great truth and Jesus continues to build his church today. Well, of your churches for Lansdowne, Jesus will continue to build Lansdowne because we're standing upon who Christ is, not upon a pastor or elders or a name of a church, but upon Jesus Christ. So the rock, the rock, is the rock for us today is Christ and who he is. The church started as Peter began to proclaim there on the day of Pentecost. He was in a sense of foundation, but that solid, lasting foundation upon which, it, which, upon which the universal church and upon which each individual local church is built is Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. There is no other true foundation and then we come on to who is building. I don't need to say much about who is building. It's very, very clear. I, that is Jesus, will build my church. So it's his. He owns it. He cares for it. He nurtures it. He loves it. He died that he would save it. And he continues to work through his spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, through the witness of the members who are already part of the church, those who are already living stones, and then through them makes others alive and adds them to the church. And the church is his church, therefore we need to follow him. But it, I've said I will build my church without defining what church is. So we need to ask the question, what is he building? Because the word church in Western society is often associated with a physical building. He's not talking about a physical building. And then we talk about churches in the terms of denomination. So as the Church of England, the Presbyterian Church of whatever place you are from, the Methodist Church. But he's not talking about denomination. Because the word church 
means a gathering of people. And you, if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 2 in those first few verses, you, you see that the church is living stones being built together. People who've been made alive, brought, built together to be a dwelling place for the worship of God. It's not the building that's a dwelling place. It's a gathering of the people. Now, Jesus is making several important points by saying, my church. He, he, he's saying that it's his church. So we've got to, to build his way. We build under him. He works through us so we cannot have our own agenda. He's also saying that he's God. He doesn't say, I will build God's church, but I will build my church. The church is called, in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God. But by calling it my church, in Matthew 16.18, he's saying, I am God. I am the son of the living God. It is my church. I saved it. It is mine that I have purchased with my own blood. He is the head, not a bishop of any shape, form or description, not a pastor, not a denominational board. It is Christ's church. He is the head and the church is safe in his hands. But he's also declaring that his headship is permanent. When you turn to the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was available in the day of Jesus Christ, the word that in our many of our translations, of the Old Testament uses the word congregation or assembly. In the Greek translation, it used the same word here for church to describe the assembly that was with Moses in the wilderness. The assembly that gathered under Joshua. The assembly that gathered to appoint David as king. These people all died. And often after they died, the assembly began to scatter and follow their own gods and really go back to the gods of the nations and other religions and move away from the law of God, move away from love for Yahweh. They went their own way. And what Jesus is saying here is, I will build my church. And because I am the son of the living God, because, verse 21, I'll be raised on the third day, I live forever, this church will be permanent and my headship will be permanent. And that then brings us on to the outcome of his building. And the fact that he is defeated death means that through his church, death is defeated in the lives of those who believe. The ESV at the end of verse 18 has a traditional translation, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And often that's interpreted, well, we will defeat hell, we will smash the devil, the church is victorious. And yes, that's true. The devil is defeated through the cross. We saw that on uh, Easter Sunday, Colossians 2.15. Jesus made a public spectacle of the powers of darkness through the cross. But that's not actually what's being said here because the word is not hell, but Hades. Now, I know that there, there is a, a, a link in, in many respects in, 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 the, in the thinking, but Jesus, when he's talking about hell and eternal punishment, uses a different word, he uses, often uses the word Gehenna. So the, the, the word Hades is associated with the place of the dead. It's the grave. It's where the bodies of people go to when they are dead. What Jesus is saying here, although the church does defeat the powers of darkness through Christ's empowering as people are saved, he will rescue from the dominion of darkness and born into the kingdom of the son of his love. All of that is true. But what Jesus is saying here is the church shall not be defeated by death. In fact, it will defeat death. Let me explain. This happens in a, a number of ways. It happens, firstly, as people who are dead in their trespasses and sins hear the gospel and then they are born again and they're made alive. 
They will go physically to the grave, but they are born again and they will be forever with Christ when they die. And then when Jesus returns, they'll be raised from the dead and the, the spirits and their bodies will be reunited with new bodies made like unto his glorious body and the grave is defeated. Jesus did this primarily himself. He gave a foretaste of it as he raised Lazarus from the dead. And even there he said that those who believe in me shall live even though they die. You can see that in John 11. 25, 26. But we also see this victory over death in the attempt over the last 2,000 plus years to destroy the church, to destroy Jesus. Death could not hold him. To destroy the church through persecution and through false teaching and through, through economic uh, restrictions on the church's activity. All of the things through moral changes, trying to pressurise and mould the church to look like society. And all of these things have come over the last 2,000 years and the church still is. People are taken away by martyrdom. People are taken away by illness and old age. Leaders come and go. Leaders die. And then does the church die? No. The grave cannot defeat the church. When leaders, one generation goes, God raised up a new generation and the gospel continues. The church continues to grow. The church reaches into nations where there is great darkness and nations begin to be transformed and the church continues to grow. There may be seasons of decline, but then God returns and restores and revives and the church continues until that great day when Jesus Christ returns and death is finally defeated. And as it were, the gates of Hades are broken and everyone is raised from the dead. And there will be the new heaven and the new earth. And those who believe, those who have rejected, will go to eternal judgment. And those who have believed and are saved will dwell forever in the new heaven and the new earth where there'll be no more death. It's encouragement to us to keep going when we lose those we love. Because while they, for them, death is defeated. They're not going to lie in that grave forever. And already their spirits are with Christ. Death is defeated. Death cannot hold them. The gates of death, of Hades, are broken through the cross. And that final victory will be seen when Jesus Christ returns. That is good news. The church will never, ever be defeated and his bride will dwell with him for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. And then the keys. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be or shall have been bound is better in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, there's not time for me to go through the different interpretations of this verse. I just want to give you a suggestion based upon the context and what we see elsewhere. The keys, given that he has just said, the, he describes them rather as the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he's also in the context of the Pharisees, who in Luke's gospel he described as having the keys of the kingdom but not letting people in, these keys refer to unlocking entry into the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew 18, 18 uses about binding and loosing in the context of church discipline. There are times, sadly, when one is rapidly, vehemently unrepentant that the church may need to use keys to for a temporary period until repentance to as it were lock somebody out to loose them and hand them over to live in the world for a while so they see their desperate need and return to christ that's a whole other sermon on what church discipline is but here jesus is talking in the context about the building of his church and the keys that are exercised are the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when confronted with a crowd in Acts chapter 2 who are cut to the heart 
And they said, brothers, what shall we do? Peter then uses the keys and he declares, repent, repent. And by implication, repent and believe. Repent of your sin. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. Have that new life from heaven. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Come out and come be a part. And he unlocks. So the people of all these different languages who, while they were Jewish in religion and may have been Jewish ethnically, they were, they, they were scattered around the world. They come back to Jerusalem for Pentecost and they hear, this is the way into the kingdom now. Repent. It always was the way. But all the Pharisees' rules and regulations, you've got to do all these things, all this perfection. Say, now, repent. The sacrifice has been made by Jesus Christ upon the cross. He died and he rose. And now there is forgiveness of sins. So come and receive that and believe. He unlocks the kingdom, as it were. And then when it comes to the Gentiles, he goes and preaches to the Gentiles and he unlocks the kingdom for the Gentiles. And in that sense of binding and loosing what's already bound and loosed in heaven, when the gospel is preached, when the keys of the kingdom are exercised through the preaching of the gospel, the kingdom is unlocked. And those who God from before the foundation of the world has chosen will be loosed and come into the kingdom. And those whose hearts remain hard will become more and more committed in their hardness of heart and through their own free choice reject the gospel. So they are continue, remain bound in their sin. And it's the gospel that does this. That's why Paul talks in, in um, Corinthians of the aroma of Jesus to those who are being, uh, those who are lost, it's the aroma of death, to those who are being saved, it's, a, it's, it's, it's life. And there's the keys of the kingdom. When you, they were given to Peter on that day of Pentecost, but actually they're not handed on to the, to the Pope, they're handed on to you. As a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you preach the gospel, God is unlocking and releasing. So where people aren't saved by being religious. They're saved by the keys, the gospel. Be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Trust him. Be baptized. Live for his glory and the power of the Holy Spirit. Be saved. And so, church continues to be built through the use of those same keys. There's a couple more things as we draw to a conclusion. Why did Jesus say don't tell, any, tell anybody in verse 20? Well, that's because they, they didn't understand who he was, as is evidenced by Peter's rebuke in verse 22. Peter took him aside after Jesus said about the cross and resurrection began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. They didn't understand, and nor did the crowds. But now there is no restriction. Jesus is alive, and we need to use the keys. And then, in verses 24 to 28, Jesus tells us about the kind of people he uses to build his church. Then, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Those through whom he works to build his church are not bishops and officials who have been through some external training. It's not the wisdom of the world that we bring into the church. It's those who've been saved, who count their lives as nothing for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ and who take up their cross and follow him who deny themselves, deny if, if it costs my comfort, if it costs me friends, 
if it costs me money, if it costs me freedom, if it costs me my life as is reality for many around the world, I will still follow Jesus. And of those saved followers, they exercise the key, they use the keys, and through their example and through their words, Jesus Christ built his church. And for us in the West who live in a bit more comfort, it's not take up my traditions, my comforts, my church culture, or even my pastor's teaching. Like, I like that the way he teaches, or I like that style, I like that music, I like this. That's not what we take up. We take up our cross. We deny ourselves and we follow Jesus. It's his church. It's his church. So uh, let me just speak to those of you who are watching from Lansdowne. In the time of change that Lansdowne's going through, or will start to go through on the 24th of April when I go on sabbatical, it's his church, not mine. It's not the elders' church. He will build it. He is not restricted by any sabbatical or any other issue that may arise during the next four months or even afterwards. It's his church and we need to keep our eyes on him alone. He's not restricted by a pastor not being around for a while. He wouldn't even be restricted if he called me away. He's not restricted in your church if you're not from Lansdowne. If you're not in a church, you're missing out on being part of his church. Get involved in a local fellowship where they are preaching the true gospel. Because the church will not be destroyed by society, by moral values, will not be destroyed by persecution. He will build his church. But he will also build his church through you. For his obedient People who firstly know who he is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the one who will suffer many things and you were killed on my behalf and you've risen again on the third day. Jesus, I trust you. But now I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be servants, a servant of you who gave your life for me. I'm going to take up my cross and follow you. And through people like that, and I hope that's you, through people like that, Jesus will build his church and death will not stand in the way. And indeed, the devil will not stand in the way, cannot stand in the way, cannot stop. And as you witness and as you pray, people who are currently dead in their sins will be made alive. And then when physical death takes them, yet they will live. And when Jesus Christ returns, gates of Hades of death will finally be shattered forever. And those who trusted him will be with him forever. That's the future. But until that day, he will continue to build his church. Let's keep our eyes upon him. Let's continue to witness. Let's continue to pray. Let's lay our fears of troubles of this world at his feet. And it's his church and he will build it. Let's pray. Father, you know our fears for the future. Father, thank you that if we are his, we are his forever. And Lord, now we praise you that you will and are building your church. Lord, if we're not yet a part of it, Lord, we turn. Lord, as I've shared about the keys, repent, be baptised. Lord, I pray that people who are hearing this message, wherever they are and whenever they're listening, they would be saved and not simply confirmed in unbelief. 
Father, have mercy. And those who are part of Lansdowne or any other church, help us to remember it's yours and yours alone. To trust you for the future. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. I pray that God would have encouraged you through these, these, the, these passages today, this text today. And next Sunday, God willing, we'll be looking where it speaks in 1 Corinthians 3 that God gives or God gave the increase. The church's growth is dependent upon him. We are responsible for planting and watering, but God gives the increase. Lord bless you. Thank you for listening.